Sure. All right. Thank you, Chris. Um, well, uh, my name is Michelle Wiesbrook, and I am an extension specialist with the Pesticide Safety Education Program uh, with the University of Illinois Extension. And um, typically, I teach uh, pesticide applicators how to apply pesticides safely. And in a normal year, um, we would have um, about 40, 45 face-to-face uh, -face clinics across the state uh, where we would um, have short courses and then applicators could take the test. Um, this year with COVID, things are a little different. Um, so we've moved everything online and, and now I'm working from home and you can see my, my living room behind me here. Um, but it's, uh, it's good to see some faces out there and uh, I'm, I'm happy to speak with you all today. Um, also, I should mention too, I guess, um, my area is weed science. Um, on, our, um, on our team, um, we have you know, a weeds person, an equipment person, um, one that uh, specializes in diseases and another in insects. And then we have an IPM person too, but my area is weeds. So um, with that, um, we're gonna talk about uh, safe use of uh, herbicide in natural settings today. I'm gonna go ahead and shut off my camera um, provided I can find the right button here today. Um, and oh, we're over here on the buttons. Um, you guys don't wanna see me read my notes and I'm um, sharing bandwidth here at home with my husband and my son. Um, so we're gonna shut that off and we'll continue on here. All right, uh, so to some, uh, the use of herbicides in natural settings may seem a little ironic, uh, but certainly herbicides are indeed a useful and valuable tool for landowners and managers. And natural areas can be overtaken by invasive weeds, which of course are also natural, but not good. Uh, weeds can alter ecosystems and rob sunlight, water, nutrients from desirable plants, uh, which of course affects their growth and yield. And of course, we typically recommend that non-chemical methods be implemented first before resorting to using herbicides. So hand or physical removal um, can be implemented um, as with any other control method. Let's see if I can get my slide advanced here. There we go. Um, and there are, of course, you know, pros and cons as with any other method. Um, it can result in instant gratification. Uh, the flowering stalks of garlic mustard uh, can be pulled out, thus ending the plant's life cycle. But there may be limitations. Uh, perhaps you have many more plants than you have workers. Perhaps the plants needing to be removed can't be reached due to their location, or perhaps they must be handled carefully due to possible dermal reactions, uh, which is the case with wild parsnip uh, or poison ivy. Um, others may have thorns or prickles, such as multiflora rose or bull thistle, um, or um, an abundance of pollen maybe, such as uh, ragweed. Hand digging uh, or grubbing doesn't always result in effective control, uh, or it may not be possible to remove all the roots. Uh, certainly the case with larger woody species, but even with rhizomatous perennial spreaders such as Canada thistle or quackgrass. Uh, now many of us have experienced the joy of digging up these weeds only to feel the snap of the rhizomes break off and know that uh, right then and there that the growth will return. Um, we may be limited in our physical abilities and um, physical removal can result in sore muscles. Uh, we can use large equipment such as cutters and mowers, which helps, um, but certain woody species will send up shoots after cutting and often cutting must be repeated and that's time consuming. So that takes us back to herbicides, uh, which also have pros and cons. Um, these can be used after cutting to prevent new sprouts and provide a more complete kill. Uh, they can also provide long lasting, selective, quick control in an efficient manner. Uh, of course, you know, this is product dependent. Uh, some herbicides are slower acting than others and some do not provide residual control, but instead work on just the weeds present at application. 
Uh, so residual can be good and it can be bad. There are uses for both types. Uh, herbicides are often less labor intensive, uh, they're less time consuming, and they're more economical. However, they are not suitable for every situation and off-target movement can occur. And this is where the herbicide uh, would move out of the area intended for application and it can cause injury. So off-target movement uh, can result in much damage to desirable vegetation, humans and wildlife. Um, if we're careless or if weather conditions are not appropriate, uh, it could happen on your property or worse yet on your neighbors. Uh, drift can be extremely expensive with fines and legal counsel. Uh, pesticides become environmental hazards when they move off target. And ideally, a pesticide should affect only the target pests and persist no longer than necessary to control them. Uh, problems occur uh, when we have um, when pesticides are used in a way other than what's directed on the label, or maybe when spills occur. Um, we'll discuss the factors that lead to off-target movement later. Uh, unfortunately, this isn't a new problem. As long as we've had herbicides, we've had off-target movement. Uh, now pesticides can help or they can harm the environment. So it's important for users to be aware of the environmental risks and, and use practices that minimize adverse effects. An integrated uh, approach uh, would of course be recommended. Uh, and this is referred to as integrated pest management or IPM. Uh, the most efficient and successful weed control programs will include the use of non-chemical controls. Um, these can include cultural controls, um, such as controlling weeds early before they set seed to prevent future weeds, uh, planting competitive ground covers or using mulch, um, using weed-free materials to avoid introducing weeds, and cleaning equipment to prevent weed spread. Controlled burning, biological controls, and mechanical controls include mowing, cutting, girdling, and grubbing. Um, for more effective control, a herbicide may be used immediately following some of these methods. Herbicides are registered and labeled for legal use in specific areas. Uh, the application method or methods will be specified in the label directions. Herbicides can be applied a variety of ways and at different times of year. Uh, one very common way would be uh, to the leaves called a foliar application. Uh, the bark or uh, cut stumps can be treated. Um, herbicide can be injected into stems or applied to the soil. The, uh, the method you choose depends on many factors, including your target weed, the site, the time of year, available equipment and the herbicide. Um, so consult with the label for guidance while planning any control effort. Um, Chris, I just wanna make sure that everything is still working properly because I, I had a screen <laughs> that had you on it and it just disappeared. It is gone now. You, everything's fine we can hear you. We can still see your okay. slides. Oh, good. Uh, minor heart failure there. Okay. <laughs> All right, we will continue on. All right, thank you. Um, all right, so uh, some herbicides can be applied to the leaves. Uh, this type of application should be limited to herbaceous plants, small trees, and, and shrubs, um, as there is increased drift potential with tall trees. Uh, foliar treatments are most effective when they're applied just after full leaf expansion. Uh, they're in the late spring, early summer. And of course we want good spray coverage on the leaves. Uh, for large infestations, broadcast applications to the entire area uh, would be practical. For clumps of weeds, uh, spray guns can be used for spot treatments using directed spray. Uh, for increased application control and uh, to eliminate the risk of non-target injury, a foliar wick or a wiping applicator uh, can be used to paint on the herbicide. Um, certainly off-target movement can occur with any type of application. Um, however, most often injury occurs from a broadcast application. 
Note the overspray damage in this picture. Uh, the uh, six foot bush honeysuckle on the left was treated and um, the vegetation immediately to the right was impacted. Uh, so fortunately, the majority of the vegetation here uh, is Japanese stiltgrass, uh, which is another invasive. So overspray was not a concern in this situation. Um, but in situations where non-target drift is a concern, uh, cut stump or basal bark applications would be a better option. With basal bark applications, uh, herbicide is applied to the lower 12 to 18 inches of the trunk. Uh, this kills the tree and any basal buds that might sprout. Oil soluble, um, usually ester formulations of herbicides are, are applied in diesel fuel or kerosene uh, to uh, penetrate the bark, uh, but non-petroleum based penetrating oils are also available, uh, which are less injurious to ground covers. Uh, this technique is for selective control of trees smaller than four to six inches in diameter. Basal bark treatments are less effective on rougher, thicker bark. Uh, these treatments can be made throughout the year, except when the bark is very wet or covered with ice or snow. So be sure to um, minimize the amount that runs into the soil as excess amounts can injure or kill uh, any adjacent desirable trees and ground covers, uh, and their roots may extend into the treatment area. To uh, reduce possible off-target injury, dormant seeds and applications may be desirable. Uh, another method of application is the broadband or thin line, uh, which uses a small band, often a pencil thin stream of a highly concentrated herbicide, uh, sometimes uh, straight from the jug. Uh, and this type of application is targeted, it's precise, uh, with low risk to neighboring plants. Uh, but you want to follow label directions. Uh, this method will not be found on every pesticide label. Certain herbicides uh, may be applied to cut surfaces. Uh, with girdling, herbicide can be used for more effective control. Uh, also, herbicide can be sprayed into spaced horizontal cuts uh, that penetrate the sap wood. And uh, this is called hack and squirt. Uh, so you may see that on the label. Um, alternatively, an injector, uh, such as a hypo hatchet, can be used to dispense herbicide uh, once it's struck into a tree. Also, the uh, Easy Eject Lance is a stem injection system uh, that can be used to inject uh, capsules of herbicides such as glyphosate or mazepir uh, every four inches uh, around the base of the stem. Cut stumps uh, can be treated. Uh, often uh, stumps will re-sprout and a herbicide can be used to prevent that. Uh, the label will provide specific directions, but typically if a water soluble product is used, just the sapwood and bark are treated, um, but soon after cutting uh, to ensure downward movement into the, the stump. Uh, for uh, applications in the spring during sap flow, and when timeliness of application is a concern, uh, the oil carried herbicides are recommended uh, for those cases. Lastly, um, certain herbicides can be applied to the soil to provide residual control and prevent uh, new weed germinating. Uh, these can be applied at planting and maybe tilled or watered into the soil um, down to where the germinating seeds are. Some of these herbicides are used in non-crop situations, uh, such as along a fence line or a driveway to prevent all plant growth. Uh, these must be used with extreme caution. Uh, some of these are quite mobile in the soil. Uh, some can persist for several months. Um, label directions must be followed carefully with these. Uh, and certainly um, uh, off target damage can result uh, if you have um, roots from desirable plants that are nearby, uh, maybe get into these zones and, and pick these up. So let's switch gears a bit and talk about the different types of off target movement, uh, the factors that influence each and prevention. Pesticides can move off target by air and by water. 
Uh, when they move by air, we call this drift. Each year, the uh, Illinois Department of Agriculture uh, receives on average approximately 120 pesticide misuse complaints, of which 60% are pesticide drift complaints. Now, recently, it's been higher, and we will discuss that in a bit. Uh, there are two types of drift. Particle drift is the movement of spray droplets, and it's influenced by nozzle size, uh, which determines droplet size. Uh, wind speed, and wind direction. Smaller droplets provide nice coverage on a leaf, but they weigh less, and they're carried easily by the wind. Larger droplets are heavier, but may roll off the leaf. Uh, so it's a balancing act uh, for applicators. Uh, prevent particle drift by using drift reduction nozzles that produce fewer small droplets. Uh, operate at a lower pressure and lower your spray height so droplets have a shorter distance to travel. Uh, do not spray in winds greater than 10 miles per hour. Do not spray when there's no wind as this can indicate an inversion. Uh, check down wind for sensitive areas and use untreated buffers uh, or uh, be prepared to return to the, the to spray later, you know, when the winds are blowing away from the area. Uh, additionally, drift reduction adju adjuvants um, or, or additives um, can uh, help result in uh, larger droplets, um, but you want to ensure you have a compatible product uh, for your herbicide and your equipment. So you want to read those labels very carefully as well. Inversions. Um, inversions are where particles can hang in the air like fog and um, then they'll move once the wind picks up speed. Uh, inversions are complicated, they're being researched, uh, they are challenging for applicators to identify, um, but smoke that flattens out, uh, like you see here, can indicate the presence of one. Um, they're more likely to occur on clear nights with little to no cloud cover. And they be usually, um, they'll begin in the evening, they build an intensity overnight, uh, and then they generally dissipate in the morning once the temperature rises three degrees. Uh, so we recommend applicators uh, would wait until then to spray. Vapor drift, the second type of drift, is the movement of spray vapors or gases. Uh, these can be produced up to several days after application and they can travel a few miles. Uh, all pesticides are susceptible, but some that volatilize to a, to a uh, significant degree are these herbicides, dicamba, 2,4-D, and clomazone. Uh, a very small amount uh, can injure very sensitive plants, such as ornamentals, grapes, tomatoes, soybeans, uh, and, and vapor drift is, is influenced by the formulation and the temperature. Um, you can prevent vapor drift by avoiding applications during hot weather. Um, many labels will direct users to not apply when temperatures are above 85 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, use less volatile formulations when possible. Uh, ester formulations are more volatile than amine formulations. Uh, if you're buying something like 2,4-D, you're, you're given the option. Um, so, you know, if given a choice like that and the temperatures are warm, you want to go with the amine formulation and save those esters for cooler weather. Um, also, you want to check the label for warning statements. Um, keep in mind that, um, the, you know, the applicator uh, is responsible for drift, uh, even if it's not easily seen. So it is best to use practices to prevent drift. Pesticides can also move off a treated area with water by runoff and contaminate surface water, such as ponds and streams. Erosion can cause contamination if pesticides are attached to the sediments. Uh, many factors affect this, including uh, soil and pesticide properties, vegetative cover, volume and rate of water, topography, and also climate. Um, you can prevent surface water contamination by avoiding uh, treating bare slopes. Uh, so you want some residue there on those uh, slopes, um, not spraying before heavy rain. Uh, so, so watch your weather forecast there. Um, using untreated vegetative um, filters or buffer strips uh, to, to help catch those pesticide residues. 
Um, and then, of course, um, following surface water advisory statements on labels. So pesticides can contaminate groundwater by run-in and leaching. Run-in occurs when pesticides move directly from the soil surface to the groundwater uh, before they are adsorbed or degraded. And running can occur uh, through abandoned wells, cracks, and sinkholes. Shallow aquifers are at greater risk um, because the distance to travel is very short. Uh, pesticides can also move downward um, through the soil with percolating water. And so this leaching occurs mainly in sandy permeable soils. And it's a real problem when the water table is close to the surface with shallow wells drawing from it. Um, leaching is influenced by several factors, uh, including pesticide properties, which include solubility, adsorption, and persistence, um, but also uh, soil properties, site conditions, and management practices, including spills, improper disposal of containers, uh, and unwanted pesticides, uh, or, or maybe back siphoning while filling your tank. Leaching is more likely to occur with sandy soils, groundwater that's close to the surface, and with lots of water moving downward through the soil. Uh, leaching is more likely with pesticides that are highly persistent, poorly adsorbed to soil, and highly water soluble. Uh, prevent leaching by reading and following label directions. I know I say that a lot, but it's true. Um, you want to check the label for application restrictions. Uh, many will include water advisory statements, uh, so um, you want to watch for those. Also, um, be familiar with your site conditions. Um, choose products wisely, uh, ones that would have a lower potential to move in the soil. And of course, many problems can be alleviated um, simply by using other control methods and saving herbicides for when they are absolutely necessary. Uh, so of course, uh, scouting should always be used first uh, to, de to determine you know, if there is a need to use chemicals. Um, if you do use a chemical, you wanna make sure and use the lowest labeled rate and application frequency uh, to, to still achieve acceptable control. Um, however, you know, if you're dealing with possible herbicide resistance issues, um, then you'll need to use a higher uh, rate per label guidance. Um, so, so read that label for your rate. Uh, you never, ever want to exceed the labeled rate, though. Keep that in mind. Um, and then, uh, of course, another recommendation would be to use uh, spot treatments rather than broadcast applications when possible. And um, lastly, uh, you want to plan well. And so safe herbicide applications, uh, of course, start with good planning. Uh, to prevent off-target movement or accidental injury, herbicides must be used properly. Uh, so this can be achieved not only uh, by carefully reading and following all labeled directions, but also ensuring that you understand those label directions. Uh, so if you aren't sure how to interpret something, um, you know, we recommend you contact the manufacturer through their website uh, or by calling the number there on the label. Um, every product that's registered for use by EPA will have this statement uh, on the label there in the directions for use section. Uh, so it reads, uh, it is a violation of federal law to use this product in a manner inconsistent with its labeling. Uh, so essentially, the label is the law. Um, now, commercial applicators are required to demonstrate learned knowledge with a, a competency exam uh, to obtain licensure uh, with the uh, Illinois Department of Agriculture. But as private landowners, um, you are required um, to uh, test and obtain a license uh, if you uh, purchase or if you apply a restricted use pesticide, okay? Um, so an example would be um, Tordon is a restricted use pesticide. Um, however, uh, Garlon or um, Roundup would be general use pesticides and no license would be required for those. Um, general use pesticides are not likely to cause harm to the environment uh, or to the user when they're used according to label directions. Uh, and, and these can be purchased and applied by the general public, okay? 
Now, restricted use pesticides uh, will state that at the top of the, the front panel on the label um, with something similar to the example that you see here in the bottom left hand corner of the slide. So when planning an application, um, there are several factors to consider. Uh, first off, you wanna buy only what you plan to use um, so you can avoid uh, storage and unwanted product. Um, pesticides do uh, lose their effectiveness, of course, over time. And uh, um, so we do recommend that you, you consider that when you're buying them. Um, uh, you wanna ensure that you have equipment that works properly. Uh, so replace any old, worn nozzles, cracked, leaky hoses or tanks. Um, ensure that you have the appropriate personal protective equipment, so PPE, uh, per the label directions. Uh, so this would include chemical resistant gloves, uh, like, you know, you can maybe wear nitrile gloves like shown in the, the picture here. It just depends on what the product it is that you're applying. Um, but at a minimum, we recommend you wear a long sleeve shirt long pants or coveralls, uh, hat, shoes, socks, and unlined chemical resistant gloves. Um, and more PPE may be required uh, for mixing and loading, um, but um, certainly you, you wanna check the label, make sure you have the right PPE uh, and wear it um, to prevent your exposure to that chemical. Some other considerations um, listed here are kind of intertwined a bit. Um, care should be taken to reduce the impacts to non-target species. Uh, environmental risks should be evaluated, including the proximity of sensitive plants. So how close are they and what are they? Is it your neighbor's vegetable garden? Uh, if so, you know, maybe consider leaving an unsprayed buffer, you know, especially if the wind is blowing towards sensitive species. Um, or windbreaks can really help. Um, what is the proximity to surface water or groundwater? Uh, what are the weather conditions? You know, labels will provide guidance, but it's, it's recommended that wind speed be between three and 10 miles per hour to help direct the drops, you know, to your target uh, and not blow them away. Uh, be prepared to stop spraying if the wind direction shifts or the speed increases. Um, applicators can get in trouble uh, with those shifting winds. Um, typically, we want good soil moisture, uh, which will aid plant growth and control, um, but we don't want rain too soon after application as it can be washed off. And here again, you know, the label will provide specifics on a rain-free period. Um, watch your radar for rain, uh, especially in the spring with those pop-up thunder showers. Uh, record your wind speed on site at the spray boom height. Uh, we recommend that. Um, you know, you, the, the weather app on your phone is super handy, uh, but it can give you a very different information than, uh, than what you are seeing there on site. Um, you know, because who knows where the weather information is being recorded from on that weather app. Uh, so we do recommend that um, you maybe consider getting a weather meter um, just to help record um, your speed, your wind speed and your direction there on site. Keeping good application records is just good insurance in case something goes wrong or plants nearby uh, show strange growth afterwards. Um, there will be setback requirements provided on the label for bodies of water, including wells to protect water quality. Uh, for example, a label may state, uh, do not apply directly to water or may not be mixed, loaded or used within 50 feet of all wells and sinkholes. Uh, for weed control and standing water, be aware that the herbicide must be labeled for aquatic areas. Um, you wanna consider the topography and soil texture. Uh, for soil applied products, uh, there might be restrictions, you know, based on soil type or, or the restrictions might be as simple as the use site. Um, so be sure you read those carefully. Um, and, and lastly, make sure that your primary weed species are listed so that you have the right job, or I'm sorry, the right product for the right job. Herbicide injury to off-target plants uh, really has been a more common occurrence in recent years. 
Uh, we know that bad news travels fast on social media and it prompts others to check their properties for damage. Um, and, and I will attempt to uh, summarize events uh, here and, and explain how they all tie together to bring us to the issues that we're experiencing today. Um, the development of uh, Roundup Ready crops in the mid to late 90s provided producers with an effective, fairly inexpensive weed control um, that was lower in user toxicity than several other herbicides that were being used. Um, at that time, uh, my brothers and I were no longer needed to remove weeds by hand. Um, so we were, we were happy to be done walking beans uh, at that time. Uh, of course, uh, Roundup is glyphosate which is non-selective and it will control many, many species of plants, but not the tolerant crops that they're sprayed over. Um, now, Liberty Link crops were also developed about then and uh, that allowed another non-selective herbicide, glufosinate, to be used widely. Um, as producers switch to reduced tillage systems uh, to prevent soil erosion, uh, these non-selective herbicides were relied on more and farmers sold their cultivators. Um, but uh, the sheer number of acres treated with these products is huge. That alone is a big contributing factor. The more acres, the greater the chance of particle drift uh, and, and of course injury to nearby sensitive plants. Um, now I mentioned field crops here, but there are several drift cases yearly from other treated areas too, including lawns and landscapes. Uh, of course, any herbicide uh, can, can result in particle drift. But we are seeing more problems with vapor drift now. And uh, some known offenders include 2,4-D and dicamba. Uh, now, since the 1960s, uh, they have been used on millions of acres of turf grass, rights away areas, uh, and corn, um, but there has been a recent change in use patterns. Uh, they're being applied earlier in the season and to more acres uh, with the introduction of dicamba tolerant soybeans and 2,4-D tolerant soybeans. Um, herbicide resistance has become more prevalent. Uh, certain herbicides such as glyphosate and others may not always work now to effectively con uh, control certain weeds. Uh, so producers then turn to different herbicides and, and methods. Uh, and 2,4-D is sometimes used in the, the spring uh, to prepare fields uh, for planting crops and to control glyphosate resistant weeds such as water hemp and mare's tail. Now, during those spring applications, many trees, ornamental plants and specialty crops uh, such as grapes are developing leaves and flowers. Uh, severe injury, loss of yield, and even death can occur. Uh, dicamba and 2,4-D are synthetic auxins or growth hormone herbicides. Uh, they mimic the natural auxins in the plant and, and they tell the plants to grow, 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 grow. Uh, the result is severe distortion of stems and leaves. Uh, so we'll see cupping, twisting, curling, strapping, um, they can be toxic to broadleaf plants at ultra low concentrations. Um, one eight hundredth of the labeled rate can damage grapes. Uh, so that's not much, uh, all, all it takes is a whiff. Um, there have been several reports of off target movement and injury to trees, especially in the Southern part of the state. Now, vapor drift dicamba uh, is suspected in many cases, um, but making a definitive diagnosis is very challenging. Uh, it's nearly impossible to pinpoint the source of application uh, with so many applications being made, and, and the pattern is not distinct, uh, like it can be with particle drift. Uh, also, uh, weather factors, such as inconsistent temperatures and rainfall can contribute to injury too, and, and really complicate the puzzle. Uh, 2012 was a severe drought. This was followed by flash drought the following years uh, where we had wet springs and we had dry summers. Um, and that inconsistent moisture is really stressful to trees. Um, these stressors can increase herbicide sensitivity and herbicide injury. Uh, really, um, it can be the breaking point you know, for, for an already stressed tree. Um, herbicide injury on grapes 
uh, can increase their susceptibility to cold injury. Um, plus, you know, different plant species vary in their susceptibility to different herbicides. So you may have some that have been exposed and just don't show any symptoms. Um, also, uh, you know, keep in mind that um, the symptoms may may vary, you know, on one plant, whether you have applied um, dicamba or 2,4-D. And uh, so, you know, all these variables make it very challenging to replicate and confirm the exact cause of injury. Now, new lowly volatile formulations of dicamba uh, are to be used over the top of tolerant soybeans. Unfortunately, low volatility does not mean no volatility. Uh, there was widespread damage across several states in 17 and 18, um, and, and roughly uh, 300 complaints per year in, in Illinois alone. Um, the requirement was added that applicators must be certified. Uh, also, they must complete additional tra uh, annual training uh, on these products. And then in uh, 2019, uh, there was widespread damage again, um, but this time Illinois had the most <laughs> and uh, set a new record with over 700 complaints. Um, rains had delayed planting and applications. Uh, it was determined that atmospheric saturation had occurred and uh, most of the damage was in very dry areas. Uh, as a result, uh, the cutoff date for applications was moved up and a temperature restriction was added. Um, in 2020, the complaint numbers were below that of 2017 and 2018 at only 146, um, yet, you know, still higher than for any other pesticide. Um, but much has been learned over the last few years about factors that can contribute to dicamba volatility, including weather, uh, and tank mix partners. Um, further label restrictions have been added and uh, it seems like they're, they're continually adding label restrictions there. Um, and the labels compare in complexity to no others. Uh, applicators are required to keep very detailed records. IDA um, has uh, now issued an earlier cutoff date for applications for June um, for this year. Actually, it's June 20 for this year. Uh, EPA's cutoff was June 30th. Um, and, and there's also a temperature restriction of 85 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's, um, you know, if that uh, is the forecasted temperature for that day. Um, applicators are required to consult with the Field Watch Sensitive Crop Registry. Uh, applications are now prohibited when the wind is blowing toward any Illinois Nature Preserves Commission site uh, that's adjacent to uh, the proposed field of application. Um, and additionally, uh, applications are prohibited when wind is blowing toward any adjacent residential area. Uh, now, producers are interested in keeping this new technology. Uh, they really are. Uh, they want to get it right. Uh, there simply aren't new herbicide chemistries being developed. Uh, so there, there is and, and has been a reliance on older chemistries uh, with a movement towards using other types of controls as well, uh, including electricity and adapters on combines um, that catch and pulverize tiny water hemp seeds. Um, but of course, more research is needed and it will take a while for new technologies to become more uh, mainstream. And certainly uh, the resistance issues some producers are dealing with uh, are quite significant. Um, you know, they, they are doing what they can to protect their investments, uh, but change is hard and it's expensive and herbicides are expensive. Um, they don't want their product to move off target any more than the neighbor wants it to. Um, but even with the best of intentions, unfortunately drift can still happen. So what should you do? Uh, if you expect, or, or suspect, I should say not expect, uh, if you suspect uh, off-target injury to plants, what should you do? Um, well, uh, it's important to ask the right questions. Uh, take pictures, take notes, uh, what species are affected? Uh, what are the injury symptoms? Is there a pattern? 
you know, maybe all the plants on the southeast corner of the property were affected uh, and symptoms lessen with distance away from the field edge. Um, were only the oaks affected and no other species? Uh, the, you know, these are all things to ask yourself. Um, particle drift injury, you know, will typically be worse near the source, um, uh, you know, of that application. Vapor drift, it's going to be more challenging, uh, be, you know, because some herbicides have been known to drift two or more miles away, and there just aren't distinct patterns. Um, what have the weather conditions been, and, and what were they like at the time of application? Uh, what was the wind speed and direction? What was the temperature? Uh, rainfall surrounding the application timing uh, can be important uh, to know, you know, if, if uh, you're concerned that a herbicide has maybe moved into the soil and was taken up by sensitive plants off target. What's the history of the injured plants? What's their approximate age? Are they newly planted or are they mature? Now, if they're newly planted, that opens up several other possible causes of injury and survival uh, will be less likely. Uh, mature plants with stored food reserves are more likely to survive some drift. Um, what does the injured plant normally look like, you know, under the proper growing conditions? Uh, is it variegated, uh, like, like we see here? Uh, is the typical coloring yellow, red, or purple? Um, are branches typically twisted? Uh, is it a, a dwarf or a weeping form? Uh, sometimes the normal appearance can certainly be confused with injury. And I know I've, I've seen a lot of plants and nurseries over the years that I looked at and said, wow, that looks like herbicide injury. Um, but that's actually uh, the, the way the grower is intending for that plant to look. Um, so you might run across that as well. Uh, what products were applied and how? Um, what herbicide or fertilizer? What was the rate and formulation? Um, when was the application? How was it applied to the leaves, to the soil? Um, you know, this can matter, you know, especially with, with something like a photosynthetic inhibitor herbicide, uh, where the symptoms are going to be different depending on how the herbicide got into the plant. Um, you know, what type of equipment was used? You know, what was the nozzle type, the pressure that was used? Um, of course, that will affect your droplet size. And, uh, you know, certainly if you can, you know, talk with the the applicator and, and see what else they recall, you know, from that day. So when did the symptoms first appear? Uh, most will appear within a few days, but um, others can be delayed uh, for several days or weeks. Um, the injury that suddenly shows up on annuals, you know, in late July was not likely to have been caused by uh, a May application that had particle drift. Uh, but on the other hand, it may take several months for injury to show. You know, we, we've got some woody plants uh, like lilac, honeysuckle, poplar. Um, these have been shown in research to store uh, glyphosate over the winter uh, after, you know, being sprayed that previous summer or fall. And so uh, injury, you know, may not show up until that following spring. Um, or tree roots may eventually come in contact with maybe a soil sterilant that was you know, applied months before. If you applied the herbicide, uh, you really should know uh, what your expected injury symptoms would be. Uh, now you can find that information by merely observing the weeds that you spray and, and seeing what they do. Um, also, you know, labels will typically describe how the herbicide works to kill the plant. So they'll describe injury symptoms there. Uh, additionally, uh, this publication, the uh, Field Guide to Diagnosing Herbicide Injury on Landscape Plants uh, can be useful uh, no matter what end of the spectrum you're on. You know, if you made the application or if you are the uh, landowner uh, with some plants that are showing some, some funky symptoms. Um, now we discussed some of the, the more common offender herbicides that uh, cause off-target injury, uh, but there are of course many other herbicides that are capable of moving. Uh, and, and most herbicides will have distinct injury symptoms, you know, to, to that family um, that can be used to determine, you know, whether or not uh, the injury that, that you're seeing uh, could have been caused by that herbicide. 
Um, so, um, for example, you know, if the injury symptom is a yellowing of the foliage, um, then it could not have been caused by a contact herbicide. You know, a contact herbicide would turn the foliage brown. Um, now, both parties, if known, and that's that's key thing, if known, um, really should discuss the suspected drift incident and, and rule out other possible causes of damage. Um, now, the University of Illinois Plant Clinic can assist in ruling out those other possible causes of injury um, that can be easily confused uh, with herbicide injury, uh, such, such as um, yeah, insects, disease, uh, or in, environmental stress, including heat stress, water stress, nutrient stress, uh, soil uh, compaction, and even pH. Um, and, and, and that can help establish whether the likely cause is drift. Um, now, when submitting plant samples, be sure to include as much relevant information as possible. Um, unfortunately, the plant clinic cannot perform pesticide residue tests. And without such tests, the cause of a symptom cannot be attributed to pesticide drift with 100% certainty, okay? Um, also, um, please contact the, the plant clinic. You know, if you have any questions uh, about sample submission and shipping uh, before you just automatically mail those samples to them, make sure they're going to be around and um, that you are doing it in the proper manner. Um, you could submit samples to a testing lab. Uh, however, there are are uh, really only a few labs that test for herbicide residues, and they are specific um, to the, uh, the herbicide or the herbicide family. Now, um, I called uh, a couple of labs a few years ago, uh, and at that time, I was told that um, by the one lab, they said that uh, glyphosate is one test. Another test is the phenoxy screen that could test for dicamba, 2,4-D, and triclopyr because they're all related herbicides. Um, another screen that they had uh, was for soil sterilants and brush killers like atrazine and bromacil. Um, so they said that, you know, you really have to have a good idea of the herbicide residues um, that are uh, present. Um, and, and two, it can be really expensive. Uh, the samples were 220 to $500 each. And that was a couple of years ago. Um, and they said that, you know, a person can certainly rack up several hundred to, uh, you know, a thousand dollars and still not learn what killed their plants. Um, however, on the flip side, certain, um, uh, you know, the, the, the test can be uh, valuable um, and provide needed evidence in a, in a case of uh, suspected herbicide drift. Um, keep in mind, too, that certain labs uh, will test for only certain chemicals. So you may need to make a few phone calls, you know, first to, uh, to check to see what they test for. Um, and samples should be collected immediately uh, because, you know, those herbicides break down uh, and stored in Ziploc bags in the fridge. Um, ask, you'll, you'll want to ask the lab for specifics uh, about handling those samples. Can the damages be covered? Um, is the applicator willing to pay for damages or replace dead plants? It's often faster and easier and cheaper to settle these disputes without legal involvement if you can. Uh, of course, mature trees can't be replaced. Uh, and often a, a landowner with injured plants may not know the cause of injury or, or what herbicide to even suspect. And they may not know you know, when the neighbor sprayed or if they even sprayed. Uh, so it, it may be hard to track that source down. In cases where the cause of damage remains unclear uh, or where the parties will not work together, uh, filing a formal complaint to uh, IDA, so Illinois Department of Agriculture, uh, may be necessary. Uh, IDA is responsible for administering and enforcing the laws uh, related to the use of pesticides. Now, keep in mind that the IDA has other roles that impact its handling of pesticide drift complaints. Uh, and those roles are determined by state and federal laws and statutes. Um, if you choose to file a complaint with IDA, time is of the essence. Uh, the forms must be received by IDA within 30 days of the incident or within 30 days of when the damage was first noticed. 
Uh, complaints filed after that will be kept on record, but no administrative action can be taken. Now, um, IDA inspectors have also documented injury without receiving a formal complaint. Uh, and, and that's happened in cases where you had one neighbor that didn't want to anger another neighbor, um, but simply just wanted Department of Ag to know what happened. Uh, and this has actually um, happened quite a bit uh, in recent years, this um, unofficial uh, reporting, if you will. Now, once a complaint is filed, uh, a field inspector is assigned the case. Uh, he or she will typically interview the complainant, inspect the site, collect samples for um, the lab uh, for analysis. Um, and uh, the inspector may also interview applicators in the area. They'll take a look at their pesticide records. They'll also collect weather data uh, in an attempt to determine the nature and the cause uh, of the damage. Uh, the field investigator will then submit a report to the department for review and if a violation is found enforcement actions will be taken through letters and penalties uh, ranging from seven hundred and fifty dollars to ten thousand uh, dollars so so it's a chunk of money um, now whether or not a violation is found um, ida will notify both sides in writing uh, now, remember that the department's role in pesticide misuse incidents is limited to determining whether a violation has occurred or not. Uh, IDA cannot help complainants recover damages, unfortunately. So, so legal counsel will need to be uh, sought uh, for that. Uh, will affected plants die? That is always the million dollar question and the answer is that it depends. Um, the degree to which the plant is affected really depends on several factors, uh, the type and the amount of chemical applied, uh, the time of year, the, uh, the growth stage of the plant, uh, the overall health of the plant, uh, and so forth. Uh, and typically, you know, the healthier the plant is, um, you know, the more likely it is to survive. So, you know, think in terms of, of moisture and, and light there. Um, so, you know, you can prevent other stresses if possible, uh, but we, we don't recommend fertilizing injured plants as it can stimulate growth, making symptoms more pronounced. Communications, respect and understanding are needed. Uh, pesticide applications are going to happen. Uh, producers, landscapers, you know, land managers and others have crops, lawns and, and other investments to protect from weeds, insects and diseases. Uh, so I strongly encourage you to build good relations with your neighbors. Uh, take them a pie and ask them for advance notice, you know, when they spray and, and maybe you can offer up the same. Um, by law, and depending on the type of application, they may not be required to give you notice. Um, but I think most are willing to provide this information if they're asked nicely. Uh, and, and you know, maybe if you're concerned about the health of your plants or maybe that of your family, share your concerns with them. You know, if you know what will be sprayed when, then you can plan accordingly. You know, maybe you can cover your garden with old blankets, you know, or make sure the windows are shut um, during that, you know, during the application. Maybe keep the kids out of the yard during that time. Um, but talking with your neighbors is the first step towards preventing drift. Uh, and I would discourage you from automatically filing a complaint with IDA, you know, when you see that sprayer nearby. Uh, not surprisingly, uh, that's going to be bad for neighbor relations. <laughs> um, uh, we tell folks, you know, don't be confrontational. Uh, treat each other with respect. Be courteous, sincere, sympathetic. Uh, emotions you'll find can run very high with drift. Um, so applicators, please, please, please do everything in your power to keep your applications on target. Now, if you have a particularly sensitive crop or area that uh, must be protected from pesticide drift, uh, of course, let your neighboring applicators know about it. Uh, commercial crop producers can register their sites at driftwatch.org, uh, which is part of Fieldwatch Inc. Um, 
and, and that's an online registry uh, designed to help pesticide applicators, specialty crop growers, and stewards of at-risk habitats, you know, really communicate more effectively to protect those pesticide sensitive areas. Um, now, areas registered on this site include those shown here. Uh, unfortunately, this program is not designed to protect small gardens. It's easiest and best to prevent off-target movement in the first place. Uh, drift is expensive and often results in poor neighbor relations. Uh, use herbicides only when necessary. Read and follow all label directions. Uh, ensure your weather conditions are appropriate. Uh, talk with neighbors to communicate where those sensitive plants and areas are. Uh, use buffer strips of untreated vegetated uh, vegetation uh, or, uh, or wind breaks, and finally, uh, keep informed. Now, the uh, Pesticide Safety Education Program website is a good place to start with that. Uh, we commonly write about drift and drift prevention in our, our newsletter, the uh, Illinois Pesticide Review. Um, also, we have online trainings that are now available uh, and although those uh, were created for private and um, commercial applicators, uh, really these would be useful for anyone uh, wanting to know how to apply pesticides safely. Um, also, we, uh, we author several manuals and workbooks that you can get there at the website as well. Um, and lastly, uh, some other good resources to look for online uh, include the North Central IPM Centers, Herbicide Drift Risk Management Working Group. Uh, they have fact sheets on dicamba and 2,4-D uh, that I think is, and an, they're excellent resources. Um, CDMS is a, uh, it's a website that hosts free searchable pesticide labels. Um, so that can be very useful. Um, and then uh, lastly, NPIC uh, is the National Pesticide Information Center. It's an excellent resource uh, for objective, science-based information about a wide variety of pesticide-related subjects.